Um, my name is Rakesh and I'm the Provincial Coordinator for Research here at Alzheimer's Society of BC. Um, at the Society, our mission is to ensure people affected by dementia are not alone by educating, mobilising uh, a broader community of care around them and supporting valuable research into the disease and people living with it. This includes making research more accessible and connecting research to more people. So in that spirit, we're very happy to be hosting a not so local researcher, uh, Nolana Nubao. Now, Nolana is a postdoctoral fellow in the School of Public Health Sciences at the University of Waterloo. Nolana's PhD thesis focused on developing the Canadian guideline for safe wandering, which is presently being used across the country. More recently, Nolana's research has focused on devising and advocating for solutions that balance risk and autonomy for persons with dementia that are at risk of getting lost and who have gone missing. And Nolana is the co-founder of the International Consortium on Dementia and Wayfinding. Now, before I hand over to Nolana, I just want to reiterate what Laurie was saying and remind everyone that because this is one of our lecture style presentations, we're going to keep everyone's cameras turned off and microphones muted. But we definitely want to hear from you. And so we encourage you to use the chat box to share your questions and thoughts as we go along. So please feel free to type your questions related to the presentation in the chat box at any time. Over to you, Nolana. Thank you so much, Rakesh. So I'm just going to share my screen here, so bear with me. Alrighty. So thank you so much again um, to Rakesh um, for the invitation to be a part of this amazing webinar series. Um, so as Rakesh had mentioned in my bio, so my name is Nolana Neubauer. Um, so my background, um, I have a PhD in rehab science that I completed at the University of Alberta in 2015. Um, I then went back to school and actually became an occupational therapist. Um, so I hold two different hats. I have a research brain, but I very much have a front line um, frontline practice brain. And so today I'll be providing a presentation titled Disorientation Among People Living with Dementia. So I'm calling you all from Edmonton, Alberta. Um, so while I work part time um, as a researcher at the University of Waterloo, I am working my full time gig as an occupational therapist system case manager um, with Alberta Health Services in Edmonton zone. Um, so talking about this topic, about disorientation, about getting lost and going missing, this is very much a population that I work with on a regular basis. Almost all my clients are complex seniors leaving the hospitals in the Edmonton area. So it's always great to be able to talk about the research, but then also be able to share the experiences about how some of these different strategies can help as we try to age and live well with dementia in the community. So before I get started on talking about this actual topic, um, I always like to introduce a couple key members um, of the research team that I've been honored to be a part of for many of these individuals um, since I started my PhD in Edmonton in 2015. So I'm presently a part of the Aging and Innovation Research Program at the University of Waterloo, and we are led by the amazing Dr. Lily Liu, who is the professor and dean of the Faculty of Health. Back when I was doing my doctorate at U of A, um, she was actually my PhD supervisor there. And this area of disorientation and getting lost among persons living with dementia that started with my PhD became so successful. And while I had a couple questions to have answered my PhD, we had a million more questions. It always seems to be the way of research. And it actually turned into this entire research program where we're solely focused on finding different strategies and different ways to reduce the risks of getting lost and going missing. As well, we have many other team members that I've known over the last seven years. Um, Dr. Antonio Miguel Cruz, he is based out of Edmonton and he has an engineering background. And we always say he's an honorary OT as his wife is also an occupational therapist. Um, I've worked with Christine Dom for many years and she's an OT herself. And then we also have Hector Perez, um, who is a postdoctoral fellow. And he has many other areas of expertise as well that's really brought the strength of this research team. So for this topic of disorientation, getting lost and going missing, I always like to use this slide and I tweak it for every presentation I provide um, because it just really shows the importance in terms of why we are doing research in this area. 
So all you need to do is Google a lost older adult or a lost person living with dementia, and you will come across numerous news articles, such as the ones you see on this slide. Um, in fact, all these news articles were ones that I just did a Google search on Monday, specifically to BC, and all of these are quite recent over the last couple months. Um, so we know when someone gets disoriented, when they get lost, um, there's many different risks that I will bring forward. And we know, though, that there are many chances where there are happy stories, where they're able to find them right away and it's where we're all OK. But when they do get lost and go missing, sometimes they're gone missing for days. Sometimes they're unfortunately found deceased since we all live in very difficult weather um, here in Canada. I personally lived in BC and Kelowna for about five years, and I know it can get a little chilly there along with the northern parts of the province and Prince George. So it really increases the urgency of trying to find them as soon as possible. And then some of the most harrowing cases are the cases where they go missing and they're never found again. Um, so the case of Shen No, um, I've gotten the chance to know his son, Sam No, really when I started my this whole research process um, in 2015. And for the concept of Sam, his father went missing from Coquitlam back in 2013 and they've yet to find his remains. And I know that we're starting to see more and more of these cases where we're not finding them in time. And so we know that as more and more people get older and more and more people are being diagnosed with dementia, this just shows the urgency that we really need to start to address this. So to give some numbers, I know numbers sometimes speak louder than um, even just headlines. Um, so what are we looking at in terms of the risks of going missing? Um, so they always say that about six out of 10 people with dementia will wander. I will define that a little bit in the next up and coming slides. But out of this number, um, it is estimated that approximately 60% of these individuals will go missing at least once. And again, the urgency of being able to find them when they go missing is that if they're not found within 24 hours, um, it is estimated that up to 50% of these individuals will be found seriously injured or deceased. And again, I can only imagine that the statistics are even higher when you're dealing with really harsh weather. Like it's, I know that can't, um, in Edmonton, it's we're not done with our cold weather yet. And they're saying it's supposed to go to minus 30 in a week. And we know that rather than 24 hours, we're talking about a couple minutes to find this person. And then another key stat is that nearly 95% of this population is actually found within a quarter of a mile. But I'll highlight to you why it might be a small perimeter, why it might be so difficult to find them when they become disoriented. So the risk of going missing. So essentially I broke it down into rural and urban communities because like Alberta and BC, we have very urbanized communities but we also have very rural communities. And when we do get lost and we go missing, that's gonna have a huge influence in terms of the type of risk that can happen if you get lost and you have no idea where you are. Um, so if you look at this image on the top left-hand side, so there's something that a lot of the search and rescue officers I've worked with along the way, um, they've actually found that people living with dementia happen to have a, an attraction for bodies of water. And so when we're talking about massive lakes, and I know BC has many of them, um, there's big warning signs with these massive bodies of water because with them being attracted to large bodies of water, unfortunately, there's been many missing cases where they're found deceased alongside these uh, along these bodies of water. Or they're found that where they've drowned. And so that as soon as you know that there's a lake, that tends to be one of the first places we go is, is OK, like it's are they near one of these bodies of water? But then as well, um, again, just the differences in geography and climate when we're looking at rural communities in Canada is that we have vast areas of woods. And again, when they end up going out into the woods, it can be very difficult to find them in a different way where it's so hard to find them just because of the mass brushes that are around. As well, when we're looking at the mountains, again, it has its own different landscapes and increases the difficulty in terms of how we try to find them. But then when we switch things to more urban, so we're not dealing with the vastness and the harshness that comes with the environment or the weather, we're now directing it more so to the complexities that come with dealing with urbanized centers. So knowing Vancouver quite well, it's there's a lot of high rise buildings there. And unfortunately, when we try to find someone, yes, they might have gotten lost in this mall or in this apartment complex. But now we're talking about 13 different floors that we have to try to search to be able to try to find them. 
There's also big concerns where they have higher accessibility to public transportation. While public transportation is great in terms of being able to get around, if you don't know where you are and if you're lost, you could very well hop on the wrong LRT. You could hop on the wrong bus. Um, I've heard cases where they hopped onto a Greyhound bus. Um, there was a case a couple years ago where the person went missing in Vancouver, hopped on a Greyhound bus, and they found them in Calgary. Um, and then even when we're looking at areas such as in Europe, some cases they've been hopped onto the wrong plane and they found them in another country. Um, so having access to public transportation will increase that search radius where they hop on the wrong vehicle, hop on the, um, the wrong piece of motor um, transportation, and you're gonna find you're gonna have no idea where to find them. And then as well, there's the big concerns about people. So we all hope that we live in good communities, that we all care for each other, but we know that there's many areas of the cities that are not so nice to us. Um, and there's a lot of crime. And so when our loved one gets lost and they go missing in some of these different areas, there's the big concern that what happens if they take advantage of them? Um, so those are some really big risks that we really try to look at when they go missing. So this concept of wandering is something that I have brought in to many of my different webinar presentations, just because I find that there's a big confusion around it. There is sometimes people see it as a good term, sometimes see it as a bad term. So just based off of my experience um, with me working with this population and working with research experts from around the world, there's this assumption that if someone quote unquote wanders, we think that they're, it's an aimless behavior. They're aimlessly walking. So we think of these long-term care facilities where they're pacing back and down in the hallways. But that isn't always the case. Um, really when we think about wandering is that some persons living with dementia aren't always aware that they're lost. Um, I've heard cases where they just went out for a stroll into their park and they found them 24 hours later and they had no idea that they were lost just based off of where they are with, the, with their memory. And the problem too, when we look at wandering is that all of us like to go for a wander. So I myself, I am a big person that loves going out in the mountains. And so I will like to go for a wander. I, I know that I wanna go for a hike in the area. I don't have a set destination, but it's okay for me to do that because it allows me to be able to engage in things that are important to me. The same case goes with people living with dementia. But the thing with this is that when people see someone as a wanderer, they put labels. I know with the Alzheimer's Society of BC, we always talk about labels and how bad labels are. Well, we don't want to la label someone living with dementia as a wanderer because in the past you quote them as a wanderer. Well, then they're trying to send them to a locked dementia unit and you're trying to restrict them from being able to leave the facility. And we know that that's not a good thing. Um, so really there has been a push for strategies that it really allows someone living with dementia to wander safely rather than restricting the behavior entirely because there's many health benefits that surround it. So what are the risks of restricting wandering? So I already started to highlight some of these risks, but really it's we're all people and we all like to, there's different things in our community that we like to engage in, regardless of what type of medical condition that we have. So if you're not if you're no longer able to go out and about in your community, if you love nature like I do, well, then that's taken away from you. You're stuck in the house. And we know that when we're all cooped up like we have been over the pandemic has lots of negative repercussions with that. Um, when they're further along in their journey, um, their ability of wandering, following their care partner, following certain individuals in their home, it allows them to be able to express their needs because somewhere down the road, eventually they lose their ability to verbally communicate. So by being able to follow their loved one, well, then that allows them to show, yeah, I'm hungry. I don't know how to see it, but by me being able to wander, it allows me to be able to express that some of these needs are not met. And of course, with wandering too, it allows us to be able to go out and vote in our community, to be able to see friends. Um, it restricts our autonomy, our ability to have choice, um, as well as being able to go to some of these different fun places like coffee shops. I know my grandparents, they always love to go for coffee at McDonald's. And if they can't do that anymore, it's an important part because it's some cases that may be one of the few times they're out in the community to talk to people. So there's very many important pieces that if we restrict the person, we think, oh my goodness, they're, they're at risk of getting lost. Let's lock them in one area. It's while they're safe, there's lots of repercussions for it. So really this area, um, it's again, we, we started this research area in 2015 and it's only continuing to explode. And that's because it's just such a complex issue. Um, so on this slide, I've essentially broken it down to some of the different approaches over the years that we've been trying to tackle this issue. And I will very lightly brush up on some of them um, because I would much rather get questions and concerns from you guys. So I'll start with some information so you can digest it and then we can move it on a little bit further. Um, so one of the key 
key pieces we always get questions on is locator devices. So yes, that's very much an approach that we can look into. Um, but dementia friendly communities is something that's huge that we also need to look at as well. Um, things that will brush up on are like things like alert systems, involvement of our community. Um, I know that when we're in rural communities, even in, in close neighborhoods, we all look out for each other and that's different with things that we've been trying to explore. Um, something I'll go into more depth in is guidelines to manage the risk. What are some strategies we can do to reduce these risks? Um, and one of the key pieces that has really led to a multi-million dollar project that we're now leading at the University of Waterloo is awareness and education, um, such as among those for first responders, health professionals um, like myself. I know many health professionals I've worked with um, that do not know much about this area, so how do we pass off that information so they can change their practice, as well as sharing the amazing work like uh, what the Alzheimer's Society of BC does with providing education to care partners, um, as well as persons living with dementia. So a multi-pronged approach when we look at addressing this issue. So I'll start off with locating devices because that is always a number one question. Um, so there are a ton of locating devices that are out there. Um, we typically want to use them because if the person gets lost, then at least we know where they got lost and how we can find them again. Um, so I like to break it down by three different types of locating devices just to make it a bit more digestible. Um, so the most common ones, and again, we all know that technology is constantly evolving. So while like GPS devices that I'll briefly talk about is really popular now. I already know that Silicon Valley is producing something else. Um, but for now, global positioning systems are definitely one of the most commonly used um, locating devices um, to be able to find someone living with dementia. Um, there's many different, um, different types and different ways of being able to wear it. Um, so what you see on the slide here, there's um, watches that you can get um, beforehand um, through companies like Safe Tracks that's based out of Red Deer, Alberta. They did have a watch specifically with that. But something that I've been even encouraging among my own grandparents as well as my clients is these amazing smart watches that we all tend to wear. They have a ton of apps. They look cool. Um, they have GPS devices in them. Um, so something I always recommend to my clients is if their loved one is at risk of getting lost, they don't want to look like they're old that they're wearing some of these pendants like the image that you see on the screen. Um, sometimes having a smartwatch, if you wore your watch all the time, um, the cost of these smartwatches are going down. Something that's helpful to even bring in. It's not stigmatizing and it helps you be able to figure out where they are and there are apps that are included in it. But then as well, when we look at smartphones, um, now these days most of us do have smartphones and there's actually free applications that are on these phones that I know several persons living with dementia that do use it. Um, so for example, the find my friend feature, if you're an iPhone user, you're able to see um, the person that is on the other end and they're able to see where you are and it gives that peace of mind. But the key of course is to make sure that that phone is charged and making sure that it's on them. Um, there's also Life360, um, one of the most incredible persons living with dementia that I know that unfortunately passed away, um, Roger Marple. Roger Marple was a huge advocate of um, using Life360. Um, he lived with dementia himself. He was at risk of getting lost and um, he had his brother um, that lived in Ontario and his brother was able to keep a lookout for Roger. And um, when Roger one day, he decided to go for a hike out in Banff, um, he, his brother ended up sending him a call and said, hey, Rog, um, are you supposed to go to Banff? because he lived out of Medicine Hat. He says, yeah, I'm supposed to be going for a hike. And then his brother's like, oh, okay, that's fine. And then he'd move on. But it was a cool way of just making sure that um, loved ones that aren't even in the same city can keep a lookout for them. And then there's other things as well, such as um, sole insoles that you can put in their shoes. But again, there's lots of limitations, whether we actually can, whether they're wearing the shoe, whether it's charged, stuff we have to keep in mind. The other area um, is Bluetooth. Um, so Bluetooth, we have cheap things like Tile. Um, they're becoming more and more popular or the different eye tags that we're looking at through Apple products. There are things that are quite easy. And I know many individuals living with dementia, they use them as well because it's, just, it's a matter of just putting it in their wallet or putting it in their shoe, any piece of clothing that they like to wear all the time. It's a good way of being able to put it in. So then if they get lost, you're able to find them. Something else that I know is available in BC, it's also used in Ontario, is something called um, radio frequency identification or RFID. And the way that this technology is, it's it's a lot older. You almost want to think of the game of Marco Polo, um, where you release the signal, and the closer you get, the louder the signal gets. Um, a lot of um, search and rescue organizations um, are a part of this, um, and they wear a tag that's around the wrist, and it's a program that they can be a part of. So. Three different things that we can always look at when we're talking about locating devices. 
But the thing with locating devices is it can be extremely exhausting because there's so many of them that are out there. It's, I understand that care partners, you guys are super busy as it is caring for your loved one. It's how do you have time to Google and find all these devices that are available? So fortunately, our team and some of our lovely research assistants um, helped to develop a locator device repository, um, and we have the link here. Um, it's not super fancy yet. We hope one day it will turn into an interactive website. But in the interim, essentially what our research assistants did was they looked at all the available locating devices that are available in Canada. Um, and what they were able to do is put down the name of each company, but then also some of those key key questions that we as consumers always have. So is there a is there a pricing subscription fee? How big is it? Is there two way communication? Um, what type of technology is it using? What region is it available for? What is the battery life? These are all things that we got our research assistants to pull out. Um, so if you need a place to guide you to help and make an informed decision on a device that might work best for you and your loved one, you can definitely go to this link and you'll have the information there. Another key tool that it's on its way, it's part of one of our research projects with AgeWell, um, is also being able to come up with a usability tool for locator devices. And what I mean by usability tool is really, there's so many different devices out there, but how do we iron out which one is better than the others? Um, so we're in the process of developing a tool where essentially as people use some of these locator devices, they can start to answer some key questions. Um, and again, all of this was, um, we brought in persons living with dementia, care partners, health professionals, vendors, we, they were all a part of this research really to make sure that we ironed out some of those key criteria. But some of the things that were important, again, that we always like to look for is it's the, it needs to have two-way communication. And what that means is if the person's lost, they can push a button and say, you know, like, hey, Nancy, it says, I don't know where I am. And then Nancy's on the other end is trying to direct her home. Um, other key pieces is having guidance um, to be able to choose the device. We want the device to be comfortable. We want it to be culturally, socially, and gender appropriate. We want it to be affordable. So all of these different pieces will be included. Um, and we're hoping that as people start to use low care devices and they start to go through this tool, we'll really be able to start to iron out which device is better than the rest. Um, again, to further help you make a more informed decision. So while I focused on GPS devices, as you can imagine, there are so many more strategies that are out there. Um, so when I did my PhD, this um, came from one of the publications that I did in 2018, um, I was able to find more than 300 different types of strategies to reduce the risk of getting lost. A little overwhelming, I know. Um, and they can range from, you know, just getting them to go out for an exercise, um, from supervision, from education materials, to wandering detection devices, to alarms and surveillance systems. There was a lot. Um, so it really became the groundwork um, for the Canadian Guideline for Safe Wandering that I will go through um, in the next couple of slides. Um, but before I do, um, I always like to highlight some other strategies that are low tech. Um, and again, these are things that it's one size does not fit all. And I always like to highlight that we a person living with dementia is just one person with dementia is just one person with dementia. Um, we all have different likes, we have different distastes. And so it's really important to trial some of these different strategies. And I always say having multiple strategies in your tool belt. So in the event that one fails, then at least you got another one that you can pull out of that tool belt. But some of the common ones um, we see on the picture on the top left hand side, um, these are wall murals. So I worked in a long-term care facility um, in Lacombe, Alberta for about six months as a frontline occupational therapist. And a way for them to not go through some of these exit doors was to make them look like they're not exit doors. Um, again, not the greatest if we want to encourage them to go in the community, but it is something that has been used um, specifically in long-term care facilities. And the one facility that I was at had actually just installed them when I was there. But some other key pieces in terms of what would lead them to become disoriented or lost um, in many ways, depending on where you are in your journey with dementia, we tend to lose our way. Um, we might we need to use the bathroom, but oh my gosh, I don't remember where the toilet is or I'm hungry, but I don't remember where to go to go to the fridge to get food. Um, so some of the easiest things that you can do in your home is you can come up with signs and directions in terms of where to go for some of these urging needs. So the toilet is one of the big ones, as well as where is the kitchen? 
Um, and if there's another thing that's really important to that person, they're always looking to try to find that room. If you put these signs in there, it just helps guide them because in many cases they might go outside, not because they want to go outside, but they're just, they have no idea where this room is and they really got to go. It's urgent. Um, so putting in signs is helpful in the community. It's helpful in long-term care facilities and assisted living facilities. I honestly think just having types of signage is something that should be mandatory when we're dealing with those that are dealing with memory impairment. Some other key things, um, so on the top right hand side, um, this uh, this idea had come from Jim Mann, um, who many of you might know, um, he's right, in a really big name um, in BC who lives with Alzheimer's disease. But essentially what Jim would do when he would go out and about in the community is he wouldn't just go and walk without a purpose and go for a stroll, because he knew that if he did that, he would more easily get lost. So instead what he would do is he would walk with a purpose. If he's gonna go out for a walk, he's gonna go to the grocery store. He's gonna find an end place that he's planning on going in. And he would actually write on a piece of paper that address of where he's planning on going, keep it in his hand. And then when he's out for a walk and he forgets, oh yeah, where was I going again? He would simply just pull out that sheet of paper and it would remind him that's where he's heading off to. Again, super simple strategy, isn't low tech by any means, but it was helpful to him and I know it's helpful for many others. As well, for all of you dog lovers out there, um, being able to have a dog and be able to train them to guide them home if they get lost, I know many that are starting to use that. Um, while dogs are being used as guide dogs for other health, health impairments, we know that more and more dogs are being trained to be able to work with those that live with dementia and being able to take them for a walk. I've heard many cases where the dog is able to figure out, yeah, like it's, they're getting lost and they're able to guide them home. So again, it gives them that peace of mind. Something as well that's quite common is just identification tags and the Alzheimer's Society of BC does have these um, for the cards. So even being able to put in information on that person living with dementia, where they're from, what their name is, and then if they're able to keep it in their wallet or in their pocket, in the event that they do get lost, at least if they're able to pull out that piece of paper, then that's going to help identify where they are and get them home sooner. Um, as well as what I had mentioned um, earlier is relying on your community is also very helpful. I know many stories um, when I lived in Kelowna um, in some of the er smaller tiny environments where essentially that their neighbors just knew that that person lived with dementia and if they were going the wrong way their neighbor would come out and say hey where are you going and then they'd guide them back home. Um, so it's more than just strategies just having amazing people in the community can be helpful. Um, as well, having a, a notebook and being able to write down different things that you might forget or where to go, writing down directions, that's important to have in case you forget where you're going, then you can rely on that. And then as well, there is the medic alert bracelet um, that I know has been used for a number of years. And that's a cool way where you just wear it around your wrist. And if you get lost, then at least there's a phone number that the person can call so it can help direct them home. And one of the key pieces as well that I really learned, um, especially when I was working in long-term care, um, is while there's all these strategies of reducing the risk of getting lost really, to try to explore the underlying antecedents. And what I mean by antecedents is again, there's always a reason for why we do certain behaviors. So when I worked in long-term care, um, we had one gentleman that was constantly going into people's rooms and he was getting disoriented in there. And we came to learn that he actually used to work as a nurse um, and he was doing his rounds at night. Um, so rather than just shooing him back to his room, what we would do is we'd just give him a clipboard and then he was a part of some of those activities. Um, they might be upset. They might be overwhelmed saying that they, they, they don't, this isn't their home. Well, because where they are in their journey, they may not recognize this place as their home. And so I know that there's some cool different studies that have gone out of even having bus stops where they'd sit and they'd just take them around, let them go out and boat and see where they are and then bring them back. And again, their need was just to be able to get out and leave and it gave them that opportunity to. So if we can really try to understand what the needs are of the person with dementia and if we can try to meet those needs, in many ways we can reduce this disorientation or when they're when they go out unexpectedly and get lost there's it's another thing that we definitely need to look at and i was a big advocate for that in long-term care so now bringing in the canadian guideline for safe wandering um so this was um, my baby essentially when i finished my phd um so really as we, we've known to this point in this presentation is that there are a ton of strategies out there. How on earth can I weed through and find something that works for me? Um, so really by creating the Canadian guideline for safe wandering, I really wanted to be able to split it up by different levels of risk of the person getting lost. And then can we put those different strategies based on their risk level just to help to simplify it. So before when I initially had this, it was a two page sheet of 
it was a um, one one sider or two sider sheet of paper that had the different strategies. But again, because there was so much information and other cool things I wanted to share, just having a handout wasn't good enough. Um, so I was fortunate that during my postdoc, I was actually able to create an interactive website. Um, so I'm going to share that with you all because this is always one of my favorite parts. Um, so this is the Canadian guideline for safe wandering. So if you're interested in it, um, it's https dot dot slash slash Canadian safe wandering dot ca. And so this website really was able to build from that initial guideline and really turn it into something interactive that can allow you to understand what your risks are, um, understand what strategies are out there and just really get to learn a little bit more about the area. Um, so this work, like all the work that we have been associated with in this research area, it has been led by those that live with dementia. So we would always develop things, bring it back to them, then tell us if it's good or not. And we would go back to the drawing board and do it over and over again and how they were happy with it. Because um, I find that while I'm a knowledge translator, it's really those that live with dementia that have the experience and the expertise. So on this um, on this front front landing page, um, you can see this wonderful image here. Um, so it, the cool thing is it changes by season. So when it's springtime, there will be a spring one. Um, and we really wanted to try to reduce the stigma that is associated with dementia. Um, so as we can see, there's no gray hair, walking with the dog, and really looking at the different signage. And you probably see it's really tiny, but one of the signs is washroom because we're out in the community we gotta go to the bathroom oh my gosh they get lost because they don't know where the bathroom is um but this is just a cool landing page and essentially when you're here you can there's a, assess your risk level that i'll go through in a second but if you scroll down and you see more information you're able to le learn a little bit more about what the purpose of the website is and again, we really try to make it easy to flow through. So if you don't know where you are on the website, then you have arrows to help guide you so you know where you are, but helps highlight what safe wandering is, like what I'd mentioned, what are the risks? Is it a good idea? All this information that I'd share with, shared with you so far in this presentation, it's all embedded in this website. Again, just to pass off that knowledge. And then if we go to assess risk level, which is the really critical part, is that you have a series of questions. So there's only six questions that you answer. Um, and again, they're all based off of the um, off of the literature and what makes them the highest risk of getting lost. So one of the questions, how often do you get lost? So sometimes I, if you get lost all the time, you'll click on that or I never get lost. So I'm going to say I get lost sometimes, especially when I'm going out and I don't have go out with a purpose. So when you click that, the cool thing is that not only have you answered it, but it also gives some strategies right off the get go. So saying that yeah, it's OK, you get lost from time to time, but here are some strategies to look at. Click on next. And again, it does guide you along for answering those questions. So another key one that puts you at risk. What is your living status? Well, I live by myself, so that will have some different tidbits of information. Question three, how often do you go into the community? Again, I, it's, I never leave my home. I leave my home a few times a week or I leave my home once a day. I feel like I get cooped up in my house, so I like to leave all the time. And the other question, um, at what time do you typically leave the house? Again, all this has, has factors in terms of these risks. Um, so only during the day, during the day in the evening, and in the evening. So I honestly don't like being in the evening, so typically it's during the day that I like to go out. How do you cope during stressful situations? And what I mean by this is if I get really stressed, I do not like to be in the area I am. I like to go out for a walk or um, there's other different things. So underneath these um, answers, so I often feel the need to leave the house to cope with stress. Sometimes I feel the need to leave the house and prefer to stay home or I prefer to stay at home and cope with stress. So you can pick. So I'm uh, I'm a fleer. And then how do you typically get around? Um, do you drive? Do you take public transit? Do you walk everywhere? Does someone give you a ride? So what is the main piece of transportation? So for me, it's I still like to drive. So then you click on risk level and then what I'll do is you'll have the low, medium and high. And in this case, based off of my answers, I'm at a high risk of getting lost. But that is OK, um, because all I have to do is read these strategies and it'll tell me based on me being at a high risk of getting lost. It'll tell me the different types of strategies um, from technology, family and friends to community that you can look at. And we're hoping because this uh, website was officially launched as part of the Ageville Conference in October, the plan is that we'll be able to put in more links and information along the way and have it more than just English. And then if you are lost, Again, then there's some strategy specifically for that. So you can easily print them off. That's why we have the download button. You can print them off and put them on your fridge or wherever you think would be helpful. And then essentially what you can do as well is if you want to see all the strategies, you want to see what they're all about, you can actually look and see all three of them.
which is kind of cool. So it's a little bit more interactive and then you can go back to About Us and then it'll take you right back to the front page. So it's kind of a cool piece of information. All right, so back to this, just so I can wrap things up and we can start answering some questions. So as, as I mentioned earlier on in the slide, so we have guidelines that are out there that we can look at. And another key component that I know the Alzheimer's Society um, of BC has done a wonderful job so far, as well as the other society, Alzheimer's societies and age-friendly communities across the country, is really great. We have different technologies and strategies, but how else can we empower our community so we truly live in a dementia-friendly community? Because if we get lost, we need to be able to find ways of being able to empower those that live with dementia, but how can we bring in businesses? Can we, if someone's at risk of getting lost, can we mention it to the local coffee shop so if they see them stroll their way, they can help redirect them. Um, other key piece that I'll bring up in the next couple slides is first responders. If the person gets lost and we call 911, who is gonna come out there? So maybe we might need some education on them. So how do we really allow it not only for people, but even how we develop our, our built environments? Can we have better signage to direct us in terms of where the bathrooms are for going for a walk on the park? Can we really help to improve wayfinding, um, especially for those that live with dementia? There's lots of work that's coming up for that. Um, so for one of the pieces for dementia friendly um, is community alert systems. Um, so I was fortunate to really be a part of this work. It started off in uh, 2017, I believe. Um, and it's really around uh, the whole top topic of these different alert systems. So I know in BC, there is something called the BC Silver Alert. And the BC Silver Alert happened to be co-founded by Sam No. Um, as you remember from that first slide, Shin No, the gentleman that went missing was never found. His son helped to co-found it along with the search and rescue officer that helped conduct the search. Um, so these alert systems are definitely something that has been an increase in interest, um, namely because when we think of these Amber Alerts, if a child goes missing, why can't we do it for a missing older adult? Why can't we get everyone to know where this person is so we can find them as soon as possible? Unfortunately, though, it's it's every single strategy is a lot more complex than we think. Um, so from what our team has learned with community alert systems is there's still much we need to do before they will be implemented nationwide. One of the key things is missing seniors and persons living with dementia happens a lot more than a missing child. So if you can imagine living in Vancouver or with the massive population that you do have, imagine your alarms, your, your phone going off like three to four times a day. Um, in Toronto, they were getting between six to eight calls a day of a lost older adult and person living with dementia. So imagine how often your phone would go off. So we can't just have something where it sends it off across the entire province. So we have to tweak around some of this stuff. So one project that we're a part of that they're looking to see if they can turn it into a company is um, Community ASAP. Um, our team back in 2020, right in the middle of that pandemic, um, we were able to run an online national forum to bring in different stakeholders to voice their opinions and be able to provide a policy brief to help figure out what we can do to move things forward with, the, with our governments. And on the bottom left-hand corner, this is with the Calgary Police Service, where we actually ended up trialing the CASEP and went to see how it would function within a police organization like Cal Calgary Police Service. So we don't really have a whole lot of answers yet, but um, one of our PhD students, um, Busola Adekoya. She's her entire PhD is focused on policy around alert systems. So stay tuned for her um, information that comes out of that. And then as well, um, one of the biggest ones that's turned into a multi-million dollar project um, is called the National Search and Rescue New Initiatives Fund, so SARNIF. Um, so this project really um, came around when I was working with the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario. They have a group called the Rapid Response Working Group. And so I was one of the co-chairs at one point with this group, and we really focused on trying to come up with different education resources for police officers and other first responders. As you can imagine, um, police officers are more and more having to do roles as social workers, but unfortunately they're not being trained that way. So they get a call of a missing senior and they don't know that dealing with a missing senior or missing older adult is a lot different than dealing with other missing, po missing populations. And even how do we approach them? There was cases that they would handcuff um, a missing um, person living with dementia, which we know is an absolute no-no. Um, so how do we educate them on that? 
Same thing with paramedics. The funny thing is when paramedics responded to the call, paramedics had no idea what to do. So they'd ask questions from the police, but the police didn't know what to do. Um, so the whole entire first responder response, they were not educated on this area of working with those that live with dementia. So this multi-million dollar project that started last year um, is consists of four different projects. Um, so one of them is developing a rapid response protocol for first responders. Um, and so this one is set in seven different projects provinces, including two Indigenous communities. As we know, how ind ind Indigenous communities deal with dementia in many ways can be a little bit more different. So we want to be able to include them as much as possible. Um, as well, we're working in developing toolkits for communities. Um, we're looking at developing a guideline for return home interviews. Um, so when the person goes missing and is returned, um, we've been finding really successful research in uh, in the UK. Where if we're able to figure out what caused them to go, get lost and go missing to begin with. It can really help us really determine what types of strategies would be more effective. And then one of the other key pieces is data collection approaches to monitor this issue, because while I gave some of those stats, we really don't know how many missing seniors and missing persons with dementia um, go on in Canada. Um, just the way the information was being collected, this was unfortunately quite poor. So our team is trying to collect this information so we can really know what these numbers are. So we can, again, really help inform the strategies that our team develops. So I know that was a ton of information, so I'm going to open it up for us to be able to have answer some questions, have a bit of a conversation about it. But if this area is something that differently fascinates you, you want to be a part of it in some way, um, while we're currently not recruiting participants for studies, we do have a couple that will be coming up in the up and coming months. Um, so please don't hesitate to contact us to sign up for one of our future studies through the Aging and Innovation Research Program. Um, Christine Dom's email is below. Um, if you're interested in future studies or if you want to become a part of a different advisory committee we always love um, people that have a passion in this area to be able to join our team you can help publish research if you have a fascination and just really help guide us in terms of making sure that our questions are providing the proper answers and then again this is my contact information so i'm always happy to answer questions um, concerns whether it's from my research brain or whether it's from my frontline brain as an occupational therapist um, you can contact me by email or as well as by twitter i know that many individuals are twitter users so you can definitely do that um, so thank you very much everyone and i am going to stop sharing my screen and then i'm going to open it up to questions thanks to lana thanks for that insightful presentation um, so now we'll go to the Q&A part of the webinar and there's a few questions for you. Um, so firstly, uh, would you have any suggestions for a situation where when a person is traveling to a place that they've been to before, but they're not too familiar with? Mm -hmm. So I would say, and again, it's, I'd have to get a little bit more context on it, um, but if they haven't been there before and you're worried about them getting lost, I'd always say like have have some of those different strategies on your side. Um, if you're able to have a GPS device, if you're able to even have some information on it, um, I know that while you might have been there before, they might not necessarily recognize it because it depends on where they are on their journey. They're recognizing themselves in their 20s. So yeah, they might have done their 50s, but they don't remember it. Um, so if we can just have some strategies though to reduce their risks of potentially becoming disoriented, I would always say do that. Okay, great. And uh, Karen has just commented, can you please copy the addresses you've shown into the chat line? We can do that, Karen. Um, we'll do that in a couple of minutes. Um, and then, Corinne had a question regarding concerns about disorientation mm -hmm. with respect to the passage of time and mm -hmm. uh, to the month and day. And I'm not sure if you would have any kind of suggestions for those kind of situations. Yeah, so for like using my OT brain, um, I'd say it's always helpful. Signs are the best. Um, like it's even like it's it's if you've been in the hospitals and you have those big whiteboards, sometimes it's cool just to be able to write down what time it is, write down what day it is, um, and to be able to constantly change that board. So even if they don't know what it is, to be able to have some of this signage will help direct them in terms of what 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 date it is, what time it is, and even some key names, right? They might forget who you are down the road. So if you're able to write down those names, it might be able to jig some memories. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Joe had a comment uh, about your piece about smartwatches and smartphones. Mm -hmm. um, and Joe was saying, 
did find them very useful for many people with dementia and Alzheimer's as they're confused by using these devices. Yeah, and that's because there's so many more buttons to push. <laughs> and and so like it's when you're earlier onset, then it's, it's fine. But I'd say if they're more advanced in their journey, definitely look at more of these specific GPS devices like companies such as SafeTracks and there's many others because then they make the interface super simple. It has the time on it but they can't push a whole lot of buttons. They just push one for two-way communication. So I'd say use those that have been not dumbed down per se, but they're more simplified to address the, those that live with dementia. Okay, great suggestion. And relate to that, we had a question about uh, the device repository that uh -huh. you were showing. And if there's a link to that that you could share, as yep, well. I can definitely share that link. It's it's everything's free from our team, so I will share it with you, Rakesh, and then you can pass it off to them. Okay, great. And then that's something that we'll will uh, share on our social media. Mm. Um, so um, just look out on our Facebook, on our Twitter as well, and uh, we'll have that link there, as well as the website and um, any other details that Nolana has presented here. Yeah. Um, and a question about uh, what do we do for loved ones who refuse to accept a diagnosis and won't wear or use a device? Yeah, and the di diagnosis piece is hard. I know that I work with many clients that it's they're just they're in denial, and unfortunately, there's nothing we can do to change it. But if they refuse to wear something, and again, it depends on where they are on their journey. I'd say like as soon as someone is diagnosed, or even like before they are, having these early conversations about getting lost and going missing is really important. And I know it isn't something that's standardized yet, but if we're able to have these conversations early, be like if you're at risk of getting lost somewhere down your journey, are which things are you okay with us using? And then you can say, I'm fine with GPS or I'm fine with this device. If it's further on, it's, it's again, it doesn't sound the greatest, but you can sneak stuff in. So I know lots of care partners that put it into, like use these those little tiles and put it into their wallet and they don't know it's there. They put it into their pocket and they don't know it's there. So I'd say you can try to be sneaky about it. But again, we always want to focus on consent, but it becomes a little tricky when we're looking at autonomy, consent and safety. So it's, I always like to leave it up to the care partner's discretion. And Alinda has commented the, oh, I've just lost it. Here we are. The words or figures on watches are so small. It's difficult to read when the person has dementia. Uh, it's also seeing small letters and numbers on the watch or telephone. Yeah, I agree. And then unfortunately, they need to have stuff that's more dementia friendly. I know that in some of the newer devices, though, they are creating applications that make things larger. So I know that the whole the entire aging sector is just exploding with all the boomers that are coming in. They now realize, oh, my gosh, we have to adjust stuff. So I say stay tuned. There's going to be stuff that's more age friendly. Thanks. And uh, a question about strategies that can be used for a loved one who mm -hmm. lives at home but feels like they need to leave to go home. Mm -hmm. um, so my mom often leaves to try and find her condo that she feels is close by. So that's always a tricky thing. I would say if she's constantly going there, make sure that you have that information on a sheet of paper, because if she happens to get lost and go missing, share that information with police. The police are so thankful that they have that information because then they will go directly there and search. But I would say if she's so adamant on it, it's completely understandable because it's not her home anymore. If you're able to take her out for walks, if you're able to take her out for a drive in that area just so she can see it, I find just saying, no, that's not your home anymore and not addressing it, it doesn't help. It just agitates them even more. So being able to take them out and even be able to see it just will help. And I always say as well, it's living people living with dementia they like to stay busy and it's the times that they're sitting around doing nothing and that's when they're really focusing on some of this other stuff so if you can find some of the past activities that she did when she was younger that she absolutely loved give her a job to do and i find that by being able to do that it's not necessarily distraction but it engages her in meaningful occupations or meaningful activities she'll no longer think that she needs to go because she's in part of stuff that's important to her Karen asks, my husband is challenged with directional deficits. Mm -hmm. uh, is there research that would help me understand this with the aim to build supports? 
Yeah, so there's a lot of different research that's on our website. So if you go to that website, we do have a lot of the publications on it. Um, and um, yeah, and it's, it's if you have specific questions, I can definitely share with you some of the publications that I know of. Um, there's one researcher in the UK. He's done a lot of work where he's actually been able to show that disorientation among dementia, it's actually one of the earliest indicators of diagnosing someone where once they start getting lost in their 30s and 40s, but 20 years later, they get a diagnosis. So there's a lot of really cool research that's showing the importance of that so I can definitely forward you along that way for that information. Okay great and when you were talking about um, rapid response and first responders um, so there's no training standardized no. training for people so w when you've done your research or spoken with people is there like a, a more typical way people respond if someone is wondering and then their loved one calls uh, police or calls 911 and yeah. the police go and find the person. Is there a typical well, like there's certain, there's certain search strategies. Um, so um, specifically, and again, some of this work was done um, by a gentleman that's most of the, the search and rescue manual that police um, really rely on come from this gentleman. They typically say that someone living with dementia, they typically um, will go in a straight line. Um, so they'll go in that straight line. The minute they hit something that stops them, then they're going to end up continuing to go straight. So we've seen cases where they go into hedges because they'd want to go straight. Um, same thing with bodies of water. They have an attraction for bodies of water, so they typically go there. Um, so I, if there's places that you don't think you're going to find them, chances are they're probably going to be there. Um, and with the standardization of um, having education for first responders, that's a whole part of this SARNIF research that we have. Um, we're working with multiple provinces because one province has provincial police organizations, some have mainly just RCMP, but we're trying to develop online resources and hopefully get buy-in from a lot of these different organizations where it becomes a mandatory um, education course. So then hopefully once they have that, it's just going to further help with how the person with dementia is being treated and how and if we're able to find them even faster. Okay, um, and I was just thinking, could you speak a little more about um, the challenges of people who live independently or um, who are isolated kind of socially? So people that live independently, that's always like, it's even when I get clients that live by themselves and are isolated and don't have a whole lot of friends, it becomes really tricky, right? It's if they don't have anyone to check in on them, you can rely on home care, but you have to be available. Um, but I'd say some of these community approaches, though, and a lot of community organizations are really starting to do a good job of being there for those that are isolated. Um, so I don't know what it's like in BC because I'm so focused in the Edmonton area, but I know in Edmonton, we have the Senior Association of Greater Edmonton, and they do have um, services that are based on a sliding scale based off of what they can afford, and they can come out and help them, whether it's connecting them to strategies, whether it's helping them with their paperwork, if you're looking at placement, there's a lot of stuff that they're able to help with, especially if you don't have a loved one there to help you. So I would say just there's there's lots of places that are building it. I know that Rakesh, you probably know all about them. So <laughs> so uh, that's wonderful. And thank you very much for that. Um, I was just wondering, because um, I didn't make a note of it myself, if you can just share your uh, slides again and I yes. can note down in the chat all the relevant websites and um, the email address. Uh, so we've got it on this chat and then that's something I can share on our social media as well. Yep, that'd be great. OK, brilliant. And if there's any more questions, we've got about five minutes left, so please feel free to just add them to the chat box. I know everyone's probably just overwhelmed of all the information. So if uh, if those questions percolate afterwards, because I know that sometimes happens, you can always email me and I can answer them after. That's fantastic. Thank you. And of course, we'll be uploading this uh, webinar to our YouTube page and we'll have a link on our website in the coming days as well. So we've had a comment. Uh, it was great. Thank you. Um, Karen says uh, this has been very helpful. We're grateful for you and your apparent dedication and knowledge base. Um, Linda asks how to distract the person from wanting to drive the car. That is tricky. Yeah. <laughs> I say like it's you have to get rid of their keys and I know they don't really like that. But if, you're, if, if, if they want to drive like just take them. 
take them to where they want to go because chances are they just want to be able to go to that place right so but if they're very fixated again if there's some activity that they love to do it's there's always a good way of being like hey why don't you come and like crochet or why don't you go and help me fix this engine right and then and then they forget and then they move on to that mm -hmm. uh lois asks uh can you just repeat the name of the organization in edmonton oh that yeah you just it's, mentioned it's the seniors association of greater edmonton so they help with an OT term, they help with a lot of the IEDLs we call. So like the, the shopping services, the transportation services, all those big questions that we tend to have. And then the home care, we deal with all the BADLs, like helping get you dressed for the day and having a shower. And as Laurie just mentioned, we will make a note of all these organizations and all the contact details and as well as on our socials, we'll put it underneath the webinar as well mm -hmm. on the recording. Uh, so it will be there and. Because um, I understand there's a lot, a lot going mm -hmm. on and there's a lot of different uh, bits of information. And so um, I haven't been able to note them down myself, so I'm sure it'll be very helpful for everyone. And I think we have time for one more question mm -hmm. um, from Karen. Can you suggest guidelines as to what indicates it is unsafe for a person with early dementia to drive locally? So I would say if you're worried about um, the person driving, there's not specific guidelines, but I'd say get connected to a home care service because occupational therapists are the ones that do these assessments. So get connected to your friendly local OT um, and then they'll be able to do a driving assessment. There's a couple questionnaires that they're able to conduct and then that they will be able to guide you in terms of whether they're safe to drive or not. OK, brilliant. Um... And there we go. There's a, there's a similar webinar. <laughs> um, oh, I'm just getting a lot of messages coming now. Yeah, use a Life360 Absolutely. app. Yeah, it's amazing. I know a lot of people that swear by it. Um, if those that are on the call live with dementia, even if you end up using the, um, the Google Maps or Apple Maps, I know a lot of them, they will just put in the location, they'll actually save the location, and they'll just hit start, and then they won't worry about getting lost because it just guides them. I know um, one one gentleman, Paul Lee in Toronto, he swears by that. So it's already in our phones. <laughs> I wasn't really, it's only recently I became aware of the Life360 app. Yeah, so, it's amazing. Uh, oh, excellent. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think we have any more questions. So okay. um, I'd just like to thank you, Nolana, for leading the webinar. And thank okay. you for everyone here attending all the different links that Nolana mentioned, we'll have them on um, underneath the the webinar, the recorded webinar. Uh, thank you all and uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so Thanks, much Nolana. everyone. Bye.